If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. We'll take our thoughts from, from there tonight in a, a general way. There will be other things that we'll refer to. This morning we spent a little time looking at how important it is to be grateful. And specifically looking at First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 34 and 36. That we'd make sure that we have a clear conception that that God is good, and everything about God is good, and everything that God does is good. And we ought to have great appreciation for that. And the fact that he would then gather us together in an environment of goodness and blessings, those things ought to make us grateful and appreciative and recognize, since he is the, the good one, and since he gathers his good people together to bless them bountifully in the blessings we have in Christ Jesus, we ought to glorify Him. The whole church ought to say amen, that we recognize who He is and what He's done, and that we're always grateful. But that sometimes is easier said than done, isn't it? Life happens, and circumstances are difficult, and, and sometimes we struggle with those things of how do we stay grateful and thankful. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have those days where I just... Uh, I'm upset about things and nothing you can do to make me feel better. Doesn't matter how kind words you share with me or how much you tell me you love me. I'm just in a bad mood and I want to be in a mad mood for a while and I just uh, pout about things. So it reminds me when I look in that mirror, what is that all about? How could things get so bad that I just refuse to see anything good? Even when your children may run to you and they're glad to see you after a long day and you're like, leave me alone, I'm tired, you know, I've had a bad day. And the blessings are running towards you and the, the joy that they're showing you is I care about you. Or you come in and, and it's been a really bad, a bad day at work and your wife has this delicious meal cooked and she said, how'd your day go? I don't want to talk about it. You know, we just have this, this disposition about ourselves where we just can't see the blessings for being in a, a foul mood, just want to block all those things out. Sometimes we have to look at it from a humorous standpoint to really say, that's a ridiculous approach to life, isn't it? That we would not see the blessings because we've experienced things that are not so good in life. One humorous thing that my oldest brother would uh, help his wife at night, you know, bathe the kids and brush her teeth. And, and uh, I remember uh, visiting with him one time and when that process was going on. And uh, they had two little boys <clears throat> that uh, just older than Paul, and they didn't like to have their teeth brushed. And so uh, he had this approach to life that he would, uh, they brushing their teeth and they'd start crying. And they'd just open their mouth and they'd just be wailing. He said, good, just, just keep them open, keep that up. And while their mouth is wide open, he'd just brush it all their teeth because their mouth is wide open. And that just irritated him. You could tell it irritated the kids because they were trying to get his attention. I don't want to do this. And they were just squalling about it. And before long, they'd all get tickled, you know, because he's getting to all the teeth in their mouth because they were wide open while they were crying. So that's kind of a, a humorous uh, example of you ought to have your teeth brushed. You know, you're going to get cavities. Your teeth going to fall out. And, and so it's for your good. And so he could fight with them about them. He could spank them about it. But hey, works out good. They're crying. I get a full uh, a view of their mouth, and I can brush every tooth in there. That's a little different approach to life, isn't it? Then struggle with those things and not say, that can be a blessing. Just open the mouth and let me get back there. Well, the mouth is wide open. And he could brush your teeth. And so sometimes we need to look at life that way. And uh, if we're honest, there are days when we don't do a really good job of that. Day and days that I just don't do a good job of that. I've allowed myself to not see the blessings. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, uh, Paul had given a lot of things to remind them of the exaltation and uh, unity that we can have if we have the mind of Christ. And that we see the mind of Christ was that he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. Now, if you take upon yourself the form of a servant, there's going to be a lot of unpleasantries. There's going to be a lot of expectations that other people have. But if you've taken on that form and that's who you're going to be, you have to stay focused on who you've chosen to be. And Jesus did. He became obedient even to the death on the cross. So we see the unpleasantries, don't we? The magnitude of those unpleasantries that he'd be willing to die 
to accomplish the will of God that he came to be a servant to accomplish. So in the midst of explaining all those things and humility that we ought to have in, in serving the Lord and the blessings he bestowed upon us, then he says in verse 14, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that we may be blameless, harmless sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom we shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So Paul's saying how you behave yourself is not only going to reflect on you and what your relationship to the Lord is, and is going to diminish the humility that Christ exhibited in becoming a servant, but I've shared these truths with you and it will reflect on my work with you. That either I didn't do my work well or you're not making application of those things well. But by indicating that they're to do all things without murmuring and disputing indicates that we can murmur and we can dispute. There's a choice in the matter, isn't it? Paul mentioned in the Bible class this morning about the, the Israelites and uh, them leaving Egypt. And God blesses them with manna from heaven, but they murmured. They walking in the midst of food that fell from heaven every single day except the, the Sabbath day. Every day. It was like frost on the ground, and they could go out and, and pick it up every single day. Rather than seeing that bread and say, you know, ever since we've left Egypt, we've never had to worry about bread. It's there every day. And there's a portion we pick up, we never have to worry about uh, there being too much, and uh, they didn't have refrigerators then, but uh, have too much in the cupboard. We don't have to worry about all those proportions. We pick up the portion we were told to pick up. It lasts us through the day. We go out tomorrow, we're going to have plenty of bread. That's always been the case. Forty years in the wilderness, every single day, they picked up bread. Well, what did they do? Instead of going out there seeing, hey, God's consistently good. He's never missed a day when he hasn't given us bread. They said, we loathe this light bread. We're tired of it. We don't want it anymore. Well, what do you want? Well, we'd like to have quail. or All sorts of things were, were in their minds of what they wanted. God uh, blew in quail and their teeth still had quail in it and they were murmuring about it. So it's a choice, isn't it? And so the instructions are, don't murmur. Don't lose your, your gratitude. And sometimes we have to look at that and say, uh, Thanksgiving <clears throat> isn't always easy. Being grateful isn't always easy. Sometimes there are things that cause us to lose our, our vision. And, and although the Bible tells us uh, to do everything without complaining, sometimes we just want to complain, don't we? I mean, it just builds up in us and say, yeah, but. I know. They're pretty nice people. But what you don't know is, rather than focus on those things that God has brought us together to do, sometimes... I just want to complain about it. And with that, I lose the ability to influence. He said, through this process of not murmuring or disputing, and that we become blameless and harmless, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means we don't do things that could be brought against us and substantiated, that that's who we become. Sometimes we do things we should not do, but we don't want to do those consistently, so that's who we become, complainers. You ever known anybody that just complains? It doesn't matter what you say to them. You can compliment them. You can uh, be, uh, uh, profusely pronounce blessings upon them. They'll say, well, I haven't felt good in years. Well, that may be true, that they haven't really felt good because they know what good feels like. But is that the focus when somebody's showing you attention and, and wanting to spend time with you and complimenting you? for the things that you do look good in. Just glad that you're here. There's sometimes you're just glad to see people. Whether they feel good or not, you're just glad that they're here. But sometimes we can murmur about that. These practices are, are guarantees to make us effective complainers. If you want to be good at it, just practice it. You can become really good at it. You can see behind the scenes on everything and, and complain about it. I'll tell you a better way to perfect it, to really get where you 
just not grateful for anything. That you perfect murmuring and complaining. We mentioned this morning that uh, Denise and uh, Paul and I went to a, a conference and it was on uh, a healthy brain and how to, you know, if you've had traumatic brain injury and those kind of things to reconnect things and, and do better. And so some of that is just preparing ourselves to, to see life differently. And he uh, challenged us to every morning we get up to write down three things we're grateful for. So if that's how we are reminded to be grateful, say, I'm glad I had a good night's rest. I'm glad I was able to awaken this morning. I'm glad I have family to share this life with. I'm glad I have a job to go to. And he went over a lot of things, and you began to think about it, and there are just all kinds of things to be thankful for. But if you really want to be ungrateful, just have a journal and write down everything you can think of that's not like you want it. Make a long list and say, yeah, I did sleep last night, but not as long as I wanted to. Yet I did sleep last night. You know, we needed a new mattress for a long, long time. Can't afford it. Hadn't gotten a raise in years. And, and so you, it begins to multiply and, and spread out on us, doesn't it? You see, the Bible uses those kind of things to challenge us, saying, here's what God wants for you. Here's what God's done for you. But you've got to keep your mind clear. You remember when Joshua stood before the people as he was about to send them their, their inheritance and he was got to go about his life and he said, I, I, uh, he's charging them and said, choose you this day whom you will serve. The God of your fathers which were beyond the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. Now he'd already listed them. God's given us everything he promised. All the land that God promised us, he gave it to us. He drove out our enemies. He used hailstones. He used hornets. He got them out of our way. The land is ours. He's not withheld anything. Now you choose who you want to serve. We've already chosen, he says. So he's grateful. He expresses his gratitude by saying, here's what God's done for me, and my family is going to be grateful for that and praise God in that. And they said, we'll serve Jehovah. And he used this little reverse psychology. And he said, no, you won't. Yes, we will. He said, no, you won't. And he told them things that they would do. And he said, we will serve Jehovah. Then he said, okay. Then here's what's going to happen. We're going to take these stones, and we're going to write God's laws on those stones. And these are going to be witnesses that you said you'd serve Jehovah. By causing them to say, here's the negative side of that, you're not going to serve him. He's blessed us. And we get to choose whether we serve him or we ignore him. We get a choice. And when they said, we'll serve him, said, no, you won't. To make them focus and to, to pay attention to that, there's another side to that, isn't it? We can just choose not to serve him. But to those people's credit, the last part of the Joshua 24, and repeated in Judges chapter 2, it said the people served Jehovah all the days of Joshua and all the days that outlived Joshua. So sometimes when we're complaining and we're making those lists of, of things to murmur about, then we realize that Philippians chapter 2 says we're really not focusing on having the mind of Christ who chose to come here and to die for us so we could be saved. So if we're making a journal of all the things that didn't go like we wanted them to go or we don't have what we wanted to have, then that can get pretty long, can't it? Set aside some time daily just to ponder what other people do to bug you. It will really bug you. <laughs> if you sit down and just start saying, ah, Sister so-and-so, every time she says, yep, it bugs me, I wish she'd mind her own business. Well, you're going to have a pretty long journal and the experiences you have in life. You know, brother so-and-so, he always tells everybody else how to live, and he's just not willing to live that. And, and so you just use terminology while you're writing. That's just horrible. That's really bad. That, that just is atrocious. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. And just fill your journal with it. Boy, you pick it up and read it and think, hmm, what did the passage say? Do all things without murmuring or complaining. And the stark reality that, that can be how we think, and we may not be writing it down in the journal, but we're training ourselves to immediately think that way. And all of a sudden, gratitude evaporates. 
They just can't seem to express gratitude about anything. And here's what we could say about each other, no matter who we are. There are some quirks that we all have. And as we discovered, hopefully this year, that there are things that we could do a little more of, a little better, where we could enhance who we are and what we do for other people, if we're conscious of it. But we can also be conscious of the negative side of it, can't we? And just say, well, rather than immediately going to that, you know, that irritates me. That is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Then that began to lay this groundwork where we, we murmur and we dispute. And though that's broader than, than this, who are we disputing with? Well, we can dispute with each other. Dispute means we can argue with and, and not accept each other in conversation. and We cannot listen to each other or not respond to each other or, or not be influenced by each other in a positive way. But when you boil it all down, who are we disputing with? We're disputing with God. Because he tells us how we're supposed to live with each other. We're to love each other. And that way we can be blameless and harmless sons of God. Daughters of God. So people say, that's a child of God. They behave just like God does. Now, what did we learn about God this morning? He's good. And he gathers us together for good purposes. So he can bless us. And that we ought to, the people of God, ought to say, Amen. That's who we are, and that's what we do. And so here is, is Paul reminding these Philippian Christians, here's what God done for us. He sent his son. His son took upon this attitude of servitude. He was obedient to everything, even to the death on the cross. There's nothing pleasant about that image, is it? Now we're grateful that he's willing to do it. But he listened to all those people who were saying ugly things about him. He felt the agony of the stripes on his back. He understood that he came for our salvation and people responded to him that way. But he didn't keep a journal of it. He didn't allow it to rob him of his focus. He was able to look down at that same crowd and say, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Wasn't going to let go of here's a way that mankind can be saved. There is no other way. They don't understand that yet. We want them to understand that, to come to realize that, to accept that. Give them that opportunity. And you see that in Acts chapter 2, they were given that. Another way that we can just learn to perfect ingratitude is to be constantly distracted. And there's plenty of distraction. You know, there's, we can look around in our society and it's pathetic, isn't it? Just a lot of things to distract us. But see, that takes our mind away from the gathering of God of us together and the blessings we have in Christ Jesus. Now, we ought to live in this world, but we don't have to let the world in us. If we let those attitudes of the world come in, then, then we're going to be distracted. You know, thankful people... Uh, We'll look around and say, you know, thankful people just, just, just can't remember how bad stuff really is that's happening all around them. There's a lot of things. Somebody say, God's so good. Well, he's good, but I don't know why he lets this happen. And, and boy, I know he's good, but there's a lot of bad things on the news. And we can just refuse to focus on the good God gathering us together to stay focused on the good things that are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the only part we can really control spiritually is to make sure we're in Christ Jesus where all spiritual blessings are. Never promised us spiritual blessings out there. That's where we're distracted. That's where Satan can capture us. You might just always look at things from a complicated sense and say, if you want to be an A-plus complainer, you must be able to both kind of multitask. You know, just, uh, just always, always multitask. Uh, don't waste your time by simply in, uh, enjoying a meal. You've got to entertain, well, not the, really the meal I wanted. You know, it's, I've had better. And if you give yourself too much time to focus on good stuff, 
you can be distracted. And people say that sometimes. You know, you, uh, people just are not realistic when they focus on good things. I don't really know anybody, personally know anybody, that's naive enough to say there's not any evil in the world. Everybody I know recognizes that. But sometimes people focus on that all the time. There's not anything that they see that is positive, and, and it'll rob us of gratitude, and we can then become ingrates. And we say that sometimes, don't even know what we mean by that. You know, it's, it's a derogatory term. We just uh, pretty much, people say, well, he just called me a fool. But an ingrate is someone who is just not grateful. Blessed with a lot of things, people trying to help them, and, and they just don't use it, they don't appreciate it, they complain about it. That's what we mean by being an ingrate. We can perfect ingratitude by focusing yourself on uh, what you might want in life. And when you go to God in prayer, that's all you talk to Him about. You don't express gratitude. You don't say, before I offer a word, I'm grateful. I don't deserve the blessings. And if there's something we ask for, that it's in the context of the blessings he bestowed. As Paul turns to the positive side of it, after saying, don't murmur or complain, you get to the fourth chapter. He tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He said, through prayers and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. You notice what order that comes in? Before he said, make your request be known unto God, he said, prepare yourself for that. Your prayers are of thanksgiving, gratitude, knowing that every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. Sometimes we can look around and say, um, you know, healthy people are always grateful. You know, and healthy people have never have really been sick. They don't know how I feel. If so they can turn those things that are positive, we ought to be grateful for healthy people. But sometimes we can turn that into to a negative and express ingratitude and say, well, they just really don't understand life. Make sure that you never are getting all the sleep you need if you want to be ungrateful. You know, say, well, those people get plenty of sleep, but they don't do as much at church as I do. You see, they can turn those things into circumstances that remove an opportunity to be grateful. When you think about murmuring and complaining, I've admitted to you that that happens to me sometimes. I hope it doesn't happen often. But there are some times when I just don't like things that are going on. And I've thought about it long enough that it just irritates me. Before long, I just, everything I see, I think, yeah, yep, yeah, but. And I began to put these views on things that doesn't allow me to see everything around me that's truly a blessing. I've tried to repent of those things and change those things, but sometimes I'm not successful. We want to make sure that the Lord was describing people of the world and he was describing the Roman Christians Paul said all these things that they left God out of their thinking and they elevated themselves in the position of God and they turned the truth of God into a lie and in the midst of all that and he said and neither were they grateful neither were they thankful it means they forgot God gave them everything Paul reminded the Athenian Christians who didn't really know God. And he said, in him we live and we move and we have our being. Let's go back to where we started. Paul said, as he was reminding them of the blessings they have in Christ and how they were to take on the mind of Christ and be a, a servant, to be obedient to God in everything. He said, do all things. Hmm. Didn't say do most things. Do as many things as you can. 
He said, do all things without murmuring or complaining. That's a goal, isn't it? Something we ought to work toward. And as soon as that surfaces, we ought to recognize, now what am I complaining about? Before I speak a word of complaint, let me broaden it out and, and see what surrounds me. Where are the blessings? It might be those children or grandchildren running toward us and say, I might have had a hard day at work, but wow, isn't this a blessing? It might be all those distractions we, we experienced and we were disappointed in, or somebody didn't appreciate our, our contribution at work, and we get home and, and our wife's in the kitchen uh, humming and a good meal, and just say, boy, I'm grateful. Not only just for the meal that I can eat, but that someone cared enough about me to prepare that for me ahead of time. May be hostile out there. I may be unappreciated out there. But wow, to come home to this, what a blessing. It becomes a challenge to us. It may be like my brother's children sometimes. Our mouth may have to be wide open for God to get to where he needs to get. And just say, okay, just keep that open for a while. Keep your heart open so I can say, can you do that? without murmuring or complaining so that you could show yourself to the world as my child blameless harmless think about that blameless and harmless what happens when I get aggravated I usually harm somebody or something it does doesn't it when we just murmur about things we don't see things we don't value things we usually harm things. Either don't take care of what God's given us or we hurt people that God has gathered us together with. We're to be blameless in those areas and we're to be harmless, sons of God. And he said the reason is so we can hold forth the word of life. If I'm complaining, and murmuring, and I'm ungrateful, kind of hard for people to see that very attractively, isn't it? Say, boy, well, if I obey that word, will it make me that cranky? Is he mad at me? Does he not think I can live that kind of life? Can I not have those blessings because of the way he's expressing it? So I have to be really, really careful in those things. I was hoping we could spend time this morning, as we did, looking at those positive things that place us in the care and, and blessings of God, and that we are always grateful. And that we could say amen, that we just praise him in all that we do. But I want us to be realistic and realize we can make other lists too, can't we? And we can make other decisions too, can't we? So we can see the contrast. Not attractive if we're ungrateful. Beautiful. When we recognize who God is and what God has done and we remind each other of it. We help each other through the circumstances that are difficult. So even in those difficult circumstances, we can be grateful. What about you tonight? You see, God desires for all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. There's not anybody that he doesn't want to be saved. And we can complain about hypocrites and people who claim to be Christians that are not. <clears throat> You've got to cut through that. Say, God wants me to be saved. The loving, compassionate God provided a means for me to be saved. And I can enjoy salvation if I'll do that. That's where we have to start. That's where we have to stay. That's who we have to be. And we don't need to complain about the circumstances of that. Those of us who have expressed our faith in Christ, who've turned away from our sins and repentance, who confess with our own lips that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who have been buried in baptism to wash away our sins, we need to arise, according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, to walk in newness of life. If you read the rest of that chapter, you'll get the impression that that newness of life is the life that Philippians 2 describes that Christ lived. He took upon himself the form of a servant. Romans 6 says in verse 18, you once, those people who are now walking in newness of life, you once were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed the form of doctrine which was delivered you. 
Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Righteousness is being right with God, who's good. Working with God's people that he's gathered us together in and glorifying him in what we do. If we can assist and help you do that tonight, let that be known while we stand, while we sing. <laughs>